leave your boots by the door, turn off your crock pot, and put on your favorite pair of evening trousers. Because it's time to talk tall to me. I'm Omen Sade. And I am Nick McGill. And this is Talk Tall to Me, a fireside chat where we give the state of Jethro Tull, broadcast far and wide so that you can know what's going on in the past. I have polio. <laughs> in the past, you had polio. In the past. If I had been born in the past... I would probably have polio. I most assuredly would have had polio by now. Let me tell you about the rickets. <laughs> in this series, song by song, in chronological order, Nick and I discuss the meanings, the history, and most importantly, our feelings behind every single song that band Jethro Tull ever recorded. Is rickets just like malnutrition, or is it a thing? No, it's a vitamin D deficiency, I think. Oh. Yeah, hmm. I think it's vitamin D. Scurvy is vitamin C. I was going to say, it's scurvy adjacent. It's it's just after scurvy mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the list of things that I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we are here to talk tall songs to you, as you know, at this point. We're on episode... Let's see, 48. Today is episode 48, which is terribly exciting. That's amazing. We're almost at our uh, our demi-centennial episode, if we released one every year. Is that what it's called, demi-centennial? Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> no. Half, a, half a centennial. Yeah. Before we get into anything, okay. we have a handful of things I would like to address. Oh, my. First of all, since last we recorded, yes. I was given by my brother a magazine by from the publishers of... Ah, uh, I love getting magazines from my brother. That used to be the only way I could pass my time before the internet. Were they woodworking magazines? <laughs> <laughs> they were. They were. Our, our, oh, I was. I our was dining working. room table is gorgeous. I was working the wood. Oh yeah. Oh uh, man, I set that one up. Mm. All right. I'm sorry. You were you were I'm just talking about disappointed. Prague. Prague magazine. Yeah. And classic rock magazine. I'm assuming they're the same publisher. Have put out a magazine called Jethro Tull. Oh my. From the archive of Prague and classic rock, it is the Jethro Tull. It's 148 pages of maximum Tull as they claim on the front. <laughs> and also very important, and my favorite part, yes. on the bottom it says, 100% unofficial. <laughs> <laughs> I love maximum tall, as if as if a doctor somewhere was like, this is the maximum level of tall that a human being can, cons- can consume safely. Sir, you cannot have any more tall. You have reached maximum tall. <laughs> Some guy standing in an alleyway being like, you want the uncut tall? Hey, hey, got some, the, got some black tar tall for you. You gotta step on it before you take it. <laughs> what? It's all... It's... I, I don't know, Nick. I'm... Okay. And on top of that, as I'm sure at least a handful of our listeners know, Jesse yes. Winter being one of them, the Ballad of Jethro Tull is out. Ooh. Yeah. I am so excited. It's so very, very good. Nick, for those who don't know, what is The Ballad of Jethro Tull? The Ballad of Jethro Tull is the first official, 100% official. <laughs> what a turn we've taken here in the last few minutes. That's right. One, one right after the other. The first 100% official publication book about Jethro Tull. Wow. The way it, it's set up, it's basically there's no there's no narrator, there's no person telling the story. It's literally just like snippets of the band members talking. It's almost as if they all sat in a group. Yeah. 
and and just talked. Wow. Ian is the narrator. The the big big blocks of text are from Ian Anderson. Shocking no one. Shocking no one. And there are some amazing never before seen photos in here. Oh, really cool. really great like archival stuff. Some really fascinating stuff. I've learned so much already and I'm I just over halfway through. So Nick, for those those of our fellow Tall Skulls who who are missing out on the Ballad of Jethro Tall, where can they get their sweaty little palms on a copy? Go right to JethroTall.com. Yeah. And you can go back to our wait for it, seven nine nineteen episode where I talk about the Ballad of Jethro Tall. Episode number twenty six for the kids. So long ago count. that I have forgotten that that ever occurred. Yep. It, it, that existed. Yeah, it was right. uh, it was on our, our vacation break. So it was one of our, what a taste of tall. A taste of tall. Yeah. And I just want to point out, if you do manage to pick up the book, if you do mm-hmm. get it, which mm-hmm. I, again, I highly suggest you do for anyone listening to this podcast, y- you like this kind of stuff. So it's worth, it's worth picking up. Makes a great last minute Christmas present as well. For yourself. For yourself. And <laughs> those who bought it before publication, who backed it essentially, get their names in the role of honor. And oh if you my. go over to page 220, you'll see a little dude named uh, Nick McGill in there. Sounds like a big nerd. So I just, I want to, I want to throw out a couple of quick little tidbits. Yes, please. It's about to get addendumized. <laughs> John Evan yeah. was originally named John Evans. Oh, interesting. I think from, from both the magazine and the book, from what I can tell, he, it, there was an S there. I'm going to quote from the magazine. By 1965, a newly christened John Evan band, a tribute to Evans's mom for the patronage, but dropping the S to sound cooler. Does it make them sound that much cooler? I'm not I'm not sure that part, but but I mean there was an S there. There was an S and now there is not. Now there is not. So interesting. Barrymore Barlow? Yeah. His name is just Barry. Ian started calling him Barrymore. That's Wow, they really played fast and loose with the names back then, yeah. didn't they? Yep. And Jeffrey Hammond. Yes. His name was not hyphenated until Ian Anderson found out that both his mother's maiden name and married name were Hammond. And so then he started calling him Jeffrey Hammond Hammond. Yeah. It sounds kind of like Ian Anderson renames everyone who who comes into the band. For the most part, yeah. That's what it feels like. Martin Barr's first original name was just Dave. Just just Dave. No, it was Nothing. just Lancelot. It was just Lancelot. And <laughs> Ian was like, that's not interesting enough. I'm going to call you Martin Lancelot. Bah. How wrong you are, Ian. <laughs> well, Nick, this is so exciting. And I'm so excited that we have another another source for our, our um, tall arsenal. Of, mm-hmm. of, of knowledge. I really feel enriched by the presence of this book in our lives and, and by the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing, I'm kind of, I'm a little bit into the magazine halfway through the book. I'm definitely seeing some overlap because a lot of the magazine is just old interviews that they did with Ian. Sure. So, so there's, there's a little bit of overlap there, but still there's a bunch of unique pictures and yeah. side articles and stuff. They're, they're both really, really cool resources, for sure. That's good. Overlap is good because then it's, it, it gives us a confirmation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I think that, that could cover that part. And before we get into the music, this week's actual song, I think it's high time we address the art, the album art for Aqualung. Let us address it. We, we, we did address, I don't know if we addressed the album art on benefit, but we certainly addressed the album art for stand-up. Oh, I can, I can give you a little tidbit on the uh, art for stand-up. If it's you'd too like. late, Nick. It's too late. <laughs> Tune in next week for that tidbit. Tune in next week for The Past. 
Yeah, so tell tell me about the artwork for Aqualung. So it's by a dude named Burton Silverman. Oh my. Yep, a New Yorker. Terry Ellis saw his work in a studio or something in New York City and got in touch with him. What, now was he a um a painter or what kind of an yes. artist was he? Yes. Yep, yep, he's a he's an oil painter, I believe. Yeah. And Terry Ellis, they wanted something a little different than the last couple of of covers. So he got in touch with this guy. They brought him into into the rehearsal space to kind of get an idea of the band. And it didn't quite he after he left, he didn't quite it didn't work for him. So Ellis ended up sending more photos. And Ellis actually took photos of Ian in his trench coat. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and Ian, in multiple sources, I saw that Ian said, hey, are you sure we want this to look like me? I think it should be, I think it should be someone else. I think it should look unique. Right, right, right. Now, Burton Silverman claims that the front cover, the Aqualung character, is actually based on him. Fascinating. Yeah, not Ian Anderson. But it does look very Anderson-adjacent. It does. It does. But I'm not sure what Burton Silverman looked like back then. We might never know. But certainly either way, there was there was a capturing of this character of this this spirit that is. Yeah, th- that's partly the performance style of Ian Anderson at the time. And I wonder I wonder I mean, it must have been also influenced by the content of the songs. Oh, sure. On the the, the back cover of the album is I'm assuming the Aqualung character sitting like on a sidewalk with a dog. So it's still, it's staying with that theme. That right. being said, the when you open up the cover and you, you have that, the kind of the, the two pager, right. that is the band. Right. That is, that is intentionally the band. I hope everyone is following along at home with your original release albums. Or you can just Google it. I mean, that is also an option. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. On the inside, the style is so, like, medieval painting feels like to me. Yeah. So there's a bit of a controversy. Go on. Controversy, as they say. (laughs) Yes, yes, they do. Between Burton and Tull when it comes to this album art. How so? The story, both sides tell the story that it was strictly a handshake deal with Terry Ellis for the album art. Okay. Period. Since then, that that image, that Aqualung character image, has been used everywhere. Yes. Posters and t-shirts and blankets and... Podcasts. Podcasts. Ew, all over the place. And Burton hasn't seen a dime. Oh, my God. Yeah. At several times, he's tried to reach out and say, hey, like, you're using this. Granted, it was a gentleman's agreement, but, I mean, you're making so much money off of this. So you're saying that he wasn't paid anything? He was paid the initial fee of, Mm. it was like just over a grand, which in 60, no, 70. One seventy-two was yeah, it's nothing to a decent at. amount. Yeah. That being said, I want to read the quote from Mr. Anderson on page on page seventy-three of the Ballad of Jethro Tull. Yes. It is the kind of offset text referencing the the centerfold art of the album. New York artist Burton Silverman painted the different images based on photos for a flat fee worth around $10,000 in today's money. I don't think it translates that that well. Which was about four times the going rate for original album images at the time. Uh Uh-huh. Sounds fair enough to me. Hmm. That, to me... Sounds very, I don't know if I want to say bitter, but 
like they, there feels like there's some attitude there in terms of like, I don't know what this guy's crying about. He got paid for the work that he did. Well, who knows? I mean, there are there are some unknowns here. And and certainly oh, I think, there's a lot. Yeah, I, I think that the theme of artists, you know, there's a whole there's a whole uh, I recently found out there's a whole industry within law of entertainment rights, entertainment law. Yeah. And that's, you know, mostly in mostly concerning film and uh, and production. But, but mm-hmm. the issues, the, the issues of how artists should be paid for their work is really thorny. Oh, sure. And as I'm sure most people are aware, the arts tend to attract or perhaps more accurately to retain people of of a certain level of eccentricity. You do, you know, you have to you have to have a certain level of 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 drive and belief in yourself and maybe ego to to make a career in the arts and to stay in the arts. Mm-hmm. And who knows, you know, who kn- who knows how this fellow came after Ian or came after Terry Ellis about further pay. Sure. You know, if sure. he was if he was super aggressive and and unskillful about it, maybe he left a maybe he left a bad taste in their mouths. Sure, absolutely. On yeah. the other hand, maybe Ian is just being a, a complete capitalist and saying this person was paid for their services that's it we don't owe them anything more which you know in a sense is a valid argument i know i'm i'm super torn i think what we should do what's the fellow's name burton silverman burton silverman i think we should all if everyone who listens to this podcast venmos him (laughs) one penny he will have 35 cents it's a start. It's a drop in the bucket. But, it, I mean, you got an avalanche starts with a single snowflake, Omen. And I want to be that snowflake, Nick. <laughs> you you are. I want to be. You're the prettiest snowflake. Thank you. <laughs> Whew. Nick, I don't know how many more tidbits I can take at this point. Well, hang on just one minute because I've got a little email. <gasps> ah! Choo-choo! All aboard the email train. I know we don't need more stings. I just, no, no, we don't. I, I, have a, I have a disease. I'm seeing someone about it. <clears throat> Your emails, sir. It's a repeat offender. Our, okay. uh, <laughs> our second, our second rating, our, our second rater as we are second rate, it is <laughs> A.J. Kerrigan writes back. He gets in touch. Alpha Jiggles. Alpha Jiggles Kitty Pants. <laughs> and his, his the, the subject is Aqualung Woohoo with a smiley emoticon. Yep, that's that's what they call him. Yep. It, it is, right? Sure. The the colon and the right parenthetical it's an oh, emoticon oh that's a, that is an emoticon yeah that, that thank you emoticon. omen well i, I got it i right. don't have a visual what in front of me i thought you were talking about an emoji <laughs> maybe you can just trust me <laughs> <laughs> I'm, more, you can't, I'm, more, I'm seeing a doctor about that you, as well you can't yeah <laughs> all right read it on begins hey hey moms i love that you're into aqualung now great opening episode and i'm looking forward to the rest of the album I don't know which bonus tracks you'll be hitting, but I hope you touch on Ian's interview from the special edition release. Mm. We definitely won't be doing a a whole episode on that, but there are some short, some more shorter tracks coming up, and I definitely think that we can can reference that. I definitely think that we can kind of do a quick cover of that one. It might be a digestif at the end of a meaty episode. Yeah, exactly. I loved that interview. It was the first time I heard Ian Anderson speak. Hmm. One of my favorite parts is the bit about Tull's interactions with Led Zeppelin. He says, quote, For some reason, Robert Plant and I never got on, and then seems to remember a comment he made about how his lyrics and Zeppelin's music would make a fine rock and roll band. Silly flute man. <laughs> and I, I think he and Robert Plant d- never got on because Zepp was v- a very big party band, and was not i i, I think that's, suspect that had something to do with it yeah yeah i think i read that somewhere in uh in one of the books keep talking tall to us ye, ye moms it's the gift that keeps on giving and don't sell yourself short you've got feck in abundance well 
Thank you, Apple Juice, for that lovely email. We always love hearing from you, and uh, and we'd love to hear from from every one of our listeners. That's right. Please, please, please send us a an email. Tell us your first contact with Tull. Let us know how you think the show is going. And and now now without further without further further ado. There's been a, a fair amount of ado, I admit. It's quite a bit. What are we listening to today? Today, we are going to listen and talk tall about Wondering Aloud. Let's have a listen. Let's wander through. Where, Where is, is it? it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wondering Aloud How we feel today Last night, except the sunset, my hand in her hair. <sighs> Oof. Yeah. Nick, can I say off the bat? Yes. That this this is one of those songs that was really really meaningful to me as a young person i was i was probably 16 or 17 when i had this album first and this song had such a profound effect on me at that age and and when i listen to it i am i'm right i'm right back to that to that moment in my life and and those thoughts that i had it's it's incredible it is it is so gorgeous it is such a beautiful song. The it is it it's the second of those really nice acoustics that we've been talking about. Yeah. And they're oh man, the the strings in there. I don't think that's Mellotron. That that I, feels I don't think that's Mellotron. Yeah, that feels like genuine string. And that's just it comes in about halfway through and it really takes it. I think one of the one of the last ones that we listened to where the the string comes in kind of almost out of nowhere halfway through, one of the critics was like, Oh, and the strings are just out of nowhere and they're terrible, whatever. I really hope that's not the case for this one too, because I just think they accentuate the the almost fantastical feeling of this song. It builds it builds like like dawn breaking. You know, yeah. it, it, it the guitar as it starts it just has that sort of that quality of light of almost like the last star of the of the night with that mm-hmm. with just when the the horizon starts to get a little bit hazy, and then it builds and builds and builds until until the you feel like the sun is actually breaking the horizon. I mean, and a lot of that is John Evan, who used to be John Evans. <laughs> you know, and the incredible piano, delicate. Yeah. Just really well placed, skillful piano that's mm-hmm. that's being layered into this. Yeah. I I actually that visual that you just said, I see the exact opposite. I see when we would go watch the sunset at the bluffs mm-hmm. in yes. this song. Like one hundred that's that is the every single time I hear this song, that is the the unbidden image that comes to mind. Yeah. It's, oh, it's just so lovely. There's something so lovely. very, very horror, um, horror, 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 not horizontal, horizontal, not horizontal, horizon, like horizontal, horizontal. Ooh, maybe. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that word. Horizontal TM. <laughs> That's right. You know what I mean? It gives you the feeling of, of looking into the future and into the past and, and sort of like one of those moments that is defined by its own fleetingness and yet has a, a sense of eterna, eternalness to it. Mm-hmm. I think this song, even more so than Cheap Day Return, really shows us just how delicate and beautiful tall can play their instruments yes i wonder if this is ian on the guitar solely Mm. 
I would not be surprised. It has that it has that sound that I associate with Ian, which is that acoustic kind of strumming with with mid fretboard runs all throughout it, mm-hmm. and uh, and a lot of hammer on technique done really well. Yeah, there is nuance to that guitar playing. It's not just simple strumming. No. Yeah, there there is. There is definite technique there. Not to say that Martin couldn't play it, because I bet he could. Oh my could. god! Of course, yeah. But it feels very, it feels very personal. It feels very Ian. I, I don't know. That's just how maybe, maybe I'm totally off base. But that's that's my inkling about it. Actually, now that I I think about it, I I don't think you're wrong at all because this is the first time. This is the first album where Ian would go into the studio alone with a guitar and just play mm, for some of these songs. Yeah. I wonder if he went in totally by himself, banged this one out, and then had other people come in and layer on top of it. Yeah. Said, D, D give me some strings and, and uh, John, give me some, some keys. Yeah. It's highly possible. I, I suspect so. And this the, the setup where they were when they recorded this. Island Studios. Yeah, but it was a brand new studio. Yeah. And it was converted from an old church. Right. I heard it had very high ceilings and apparently it yeah. was very difficult to hear oneself play in. Like even though yep. the recordings came out really well. Yeah. There's this whole story. I think it's I think it's John Evan actually saying that they th- there's one point where he said that they went in and recorded the whole album and it wasn't sounding right and they just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and spent like weeks and weeks on it. Finally took a little break, listened to it, decided it was horrible, scrapped the entire thing, started from f- completely fresh, and yeah. did it in like two or three days. Now, Ian disputes that. He says that that's not how it went. I think it was three times. I think the 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 album version that we hear is the third recording. Interesting. Of the whole I thing think or so. of this song? Of the whole thing. Now, Ian, the whole Ian album. Disputes, disputes that narrative, saying that, that he thinks that John Evan is confusing it with with a, a an aborted project that they did. Oh, um, interesting. But at any rate, I think it's safe to say that that the acoustics for the musicians were frustrating. Yeah, yeah, it was super high ceiling. It was all new machinery that they were still trying to figure out, and right. half of the time it broke. Right, right. So no wonder. I think I said a couple of episodes ago that this just the sound quality, even though it's remastered, the sound quality for Aqualung just isn't great. And that's why. But I think that it did turn out well. I think that the album itself is a good product. I think it's I think it was just it sounds like it was just hard to hear in the moment. It, I'm not it's it is a good product, but in terms of clarity of sound versus mm. Any of the other albums, even the earlier ones, the remasters, are just so much crisper, I find. Interesting. Yeah. Do you keep them in the crisper? Don't you? <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. That's where I put all of my MP3s. I keep them in the cheese drawer. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, man. Your entire How? fridge is a cheese drawer, Roman. How dare <laughs> Oh no! I can and bear it. <laughs> our our listeners come to us with a certain degree of trust, Omen, <laughs> and I feel like you have just, yeah, just just tromped it, yeah, just stepped right all over it. I'd cheddar stop. Mm, not Gouda. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so, Nick, shall we dive into these lyrics? Yeah. Do we yeah, feel we, prepared? we should. Okay. We probably should. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. It's a it's a it's a dainty little song. It's quick. So it's just two two kind of thick stanzas. So there's not much, but it's a two and, minute song. So and and yet there's so much. Then yet there's so much. Yeah. So shall I tell I, you I something? I want to I want to quote you from earlier this this evening. A lasagna of death. This is a <laughs> lasagna of of. Just beauty. It's yeah. a beautiful lasagna. This song. Yeah, I when I listened to this song as a young person, mm-hmm. this song became kind of my my mantra or my image for the idea of 
like of perfect love of i of ideal love 100 percent, yes yep and and i think that every relationship that i had for a really long time i i either consciously or subconsciously compared it to this song sure yeah and then i became disillusioned and forgot yep. about it mm-hmm. until and just now until just now and no until until uh well and, and i think that and i'm only now realizing that that i think what it was about for me is the the title wondering aloud mm-hmm. you know it refers to literally speaking your thoughts yeah and i and i think that when you can speak your thoughts without editing in the company of another person in a completely relaxed fashion without fear of judgment without fear of of having to edit yourself or say the wrong thing whether it's platonic or romantic or filial or one of the other seven Greek words, I think that's love. That's real love. The, you know, to, to be able to really be yourself and to, and to share your thoughts just completely straight. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that lyrics aside, just the reference of the, the, the track title is another goal to achieve in terms of a loving relationship yes well and then also the way that that phrase is used within the song oh, okay wondering aloud will the years treat us well what's the first one wondering aloud how we feel today do you want to add on to that or no okay <laughs> no but that's but, that, but that's what the content of the song is is about yeah oh yeah absolutely it's it's the it's the sim- the simplicity the simple concept of just being able to to think and talk with someone about this kind of stuff in your life to talk tall to someone that's right that's right also i do 100% believe nick and you can tell me if you agree or disagree that this song is <laughs> thank you for permission <laughs> yeah that this song is highly postcoital Oh, the the Basque, the the afterglow, as the yes, kids say. Yes, 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 dude. Yes, yes, they do. I'm sure. Um, I can see that. I can see that for sure. I've never, I've never thought of it like that. Then she comes, spilling crumbs, on the bed. I get. Two of those three words that you just... And I'm tasting the smell. And then Ian goes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that this song is about sex. I don't think it's about sex. I just think it's describing a post-coital moment. I, do, I don't. It's the post-sex snack. <laughs> of, of toast? Of toast with butter, which is probably the most British thing ever. We Pretty just close. made love. Shall we have some toast with butter? <laughs> oh, naughty. Uh, I, I'll, I'll butter your toast. <laughs> Give me at least five minutes. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe it's my 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 naivete. Yeah. Your strong Puritan. Well, someday, Nick, someday, Nick, you may have sex. And, um... I, I have seven more buckles that need to be undone before <laughs> before that happens. Well, you should before the before the lock on the chastity belt rusts shut. <laughs> before your son turns eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, you, that's all right. We don't have to have the same opinion on this. Correct, and and this is not the first time we've not had the same opinion. Yeah. But I do, I do very much think that it's just I, I see, I see it as as just a great him spending a nice lazy weekend with this woman. Sure. And there's plenty of sex. Okay, I get it. I get it. You don't need to say. It. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I agree. That obviously, that's not the focus of it. And and you know, we don't want to get off piste by by um, you know, going down that rabbit hole. Mm, go down mm. my rabbit hole. Butter but, my coney. <laughs> but <laughs> I but I agree. I do think that this is this is about the 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 purity of feeling between two people. Yeah. 
last night sipped the sunset. Yeah, there's there's yeah, there's an innocence there. And there's a there's a sense of being really in the moment. Yeah. It you know, it fo- I love that it focuses on these small details. Last night sipped the sunset, my hand in her hair. Mhm. You know, the the focusing on the on the crumbs. And then from those little details, I mean it 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 addresses these massive phys- uh, philosophical questions. We are our own saviors. Holy bananas. Yeah. Darn. But that, to tie on what you were talking about in the sense of you know it's a good and solid and loving relationship when you can wonder aloud. Yes. You know that's that's that, that's part and parcel. You go from a simple like, oh, how are we feeling today to some bizarre, inconsequential philosophical discussion one right after the other and then you Certainly. go oh so what are we going to get for breakfast right but I, I also think that it's describing the the state of of being of redemption through love you know that uh i was listening to some deepak chopra this morning and and one of the I, things his his new trap album is just really solid <laughs> stop it <laughs> One of the things he was talking about was, um, if, if anyone doesn't know, he's a Indian sort of guru guy. I think he make he sort of the sort of person that teacher is probably making satire of satire of. But but he was talking about, you know, love is the only reality. It's the only it's the only real force in the universe, and and it is it is it is how we redeem ourselves as as human beings that the the capacity to love is the most essentially human thing about about us. Mm. And I and I love I love that Ian I feel like is articulating this we are our own saviors as we start both our hearts beating love into each other. Yeah. It's like that's all you need. Yeah, we we didn't know who we were, we didn't know our worth. We didn't we weren't truly human until this. Yeah. Now, do, do you want a little bit of a of a of a slap in the face? Oh, I mean, since you're offering, yeah. <laughs> then we'll have some toast. <laughs> this song, there is a yeah. good chance that this song is not about Jenny. Oh, sure. There's there's a good chance that this song is not about anyone. What? <laughs> there there have. been been multiple moments where Ian has said, I didn't write songs about people. Uh Uh-huh. That sounds to me like maybe plausible deniability. I I suppose. But also, yeah, sure, why not? Maybe he didn't write it about anyone specific. I don't care. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't diminish the power of the song for me. It's, it's the equivalent of what Deepak Chopra said. It's you. Do, he doesn't need to give you examples. He doesn't need to. No, because it's a universal fact, and we all yeah. can, we all know it on a deep level. Right, right. This is just an example of that intense and, in some ways, like just perfect specimen of love. Yeah, and toast. Who is and making toast. the toast then? Is it his waitress? Is he in a restaurant? Like, what's happening? <laughs> It's it's all really just a, a hypothetical, and a it's theoretical. Only the giving that makes you what you are. The giving of toast. The giving of toast. Give me my toast. <laughs> I I love this song. Yeah, it's this it's, is one mm-hmm. of the few songs ever that really has made a has made a deep imprint on my on my mind. Really. Yeah. It is it is most certainly one of my favorite tall songs. It's up there on mine. Yeah, oh absolutely. This and Elevate by DJ Khaled off of the uh, Into the Spider-Verse soundtrack are you know neck and neck maybe. I I know you're not being facetious. <laughs> I'm never facetious. That's that is that's like saying I never speak in hyperbole, but <laughs> but I 
but it sounds <laughs> so ingenuine. <laughs> but I know you, so I know it is. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? Mm, I don't know anymore. I just don't know. <laughs> Nick, what what else do we have to say about this song? I mean, I mean, I do feel like the philosophical implications are are such that we could talk about this for ages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could we could continue to pick it apart. We could go back to the music, but I think it's really it's just it's just a really nice little morsel. the The content, the the lyrics, are just they're. I always feel so warm after I hear this song. And honestly, I wish it was a little bit longer and I don't know. I don't know if it wouldn't be as effective if it were longer or not. I kind of think it wouldn't be. Yeah. It's like it's it's unfortunately the perfect length. And does that not speak to the temporality of our very existence? At least the existence of toast. Certainly the existence of toast around me anyway. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. What is your what is your toast of choice, Oman? So there is a company that makes a a really great whole wheat sourdough. Mm. And I quite enjoy that toast. Although for my breakfast I'm eating less I'm I'm eating fewer grains these days. So mm. for my breakfasts I've switched to a sweet potato cut into strips and baked as a toast Ooh. replacement because I can still dip it into my soft boiled eggs but supposedly it's better for you I, I would assume so it's got more it's got sugars which is that's the that's all carbs are right but it's less processed because it's just straight up a vegetable. oh sure okay but I yeah. do but anyway I do like that toast what about you what is your how do, wait, how do you prepare your toast in the toaster <laughs> Like, do you like a super crunchy toast? Do you like a soft toast? Do you put butter, marmalade? I'm a fir- I'm a firm toast guy. I like it to have a crunch, but not be. I like it to have a crunch, but still be soft in the in the interior. And okay. then usually I'll put butter, or more recently vegetable butter, and sometimes marmite, because we are a marmite household. Do Do you still eat marmite? I continue to eat marmite. Yeah. I. Yes, I know. I know. I know. I thought you, you stopped. I thought you stopped that years ago, Omen. No, well, I've, <laughs> I've I've relapsed. You see, because uh, because of my because of my English fiance. Oh, okay. For okay. our listeners, so she's your dealer. Yeah. For, for my for our listeners, I had Nick try Marmite once in college, and I maybe didn't tell him what it was, and he's never recovered. He used to refer it to, to refer to it as Satan's poo in a jar, if I'm yep. not mistaken. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's it's an acquired taste. It's got a lot of B vitamins. There are other ways to get B vitamins <laughs> than to make a pact with with the devil. <laughs> Up toast as the butter runs, then she comes spilling crumbs on the bed, and I shake my head. And it's only the giving that makes you what you are. Well, Nick, what are we talking tall about next week? Next week, we are going to talk tall about Up To Me. Ooh, I am very excited about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bouncer. It's a romper for sure. Well, until yeah. next week, you don't have to leave us wondering aloud what you think about the podcast. You can tell us through an email, a review, or a five-star rating. That was good. That Thank was really you. good. It was very smooth. But seriously, every podcast asks for it. We're going to ask for but it. But we really mean it. Those reviews like really help us get seen. We have so many Spotify listeners Unfortunately, there's no way to review on Spotify. Yeah. So if even if you're on Spotify, make a dummy iTunes account and just go rate us, please. Be a It'll dummy be awesome. and make an iTunes dummy. account. Yeah. And those reviews do attract more listeners. And more importantly, they impressed my niece during Thanksgiving. That's true. Yeah. So thank you. Your 21-year-old niece who who, subs- who... She's way older than that. Is she? Oh, yeah, she is. Who subscribed to the show at the table. She did, yeah. Yeah. Hi hi Evie. 
you're, you're hearing this <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Big big um, shout out to Evie if she if she ends up actually listening to it. Yeah, if she gets this far, I bet she has iTunes. She should totally leave us a review. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Until next week, I am Omen Sade, and I am Nick McGill. We are Feckless Momes, and this is Talk Tall to Me. All right, here we go. I brought the toast. Oh, I just, just wonder, you know, I wonder wonder what Feckless Moms is, uh, is a proud member of. But I brought toast. <laughs> no, it's Talk Tall to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Moms audio network. Oh. Are Roman, you, I, I, are you going to are you, get the, there's the crumbs toast. in the bed. There's crumbs in the bed. What? We've talked about this. We've t- you ruined it. <laughs>